All right. Um, so let's get started today. We um, today we really want to continue the 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 studies we've started in the book of Daniel. And some of you who are new, let me just say that last year or 2018, I think when we started this at the church. We really didn't spend a lot of time on the first six chapters of Daniel. Um, we kind of dive quickly into chapter seven, but I am having to do the work for this class. I have come to realize why it's important for us to pay maybe particular attention to the first um, six chapters of Daniel. And so I have resisted all the temptations to try to collapse these chapters. Because I think some of the things we are studying in these chapters will give us good foundation for the prophetic section of Daniel when we get into Daniel chapter 7, um, all the way to 12. And then when we get into Revelation even, it becomes extremely important. All right? So today, we are focused on, on lesson 5, which is the handwriting on the wall, which is a very popular um, um, story that everybody talks about. It has even become a, a sort of cliche and an idiomatic expression when people say the handwriting on the wall for you, it kind of means that yeah, these are numbers, you know. So it, it, it really got its genesis, if you will, from this story. And we'll kind of decide and look at what are the various um, learnings we can get from this story today, all right? So again, we're reviewing some very key points. And today I've cut the review down a lot. So really, we're just saying that this is our theater of operation, which is really the Middle East and, and, and Europe and Northern Africa as kind of the main areas, as well as parts of, of, of um, Europe, um, more so the Soviet Union and, and, and what is the, um, the old countries of the USSR that are now um, um, Afghanistan and some of the other countries, right? So this is kind of where we are. And in some instances, when we talk about the Persian Empire, we said they went as far down as India. Let's keep going. One of the things we established very quickly was that um, if we go back to our map, Israel is really on this little tiny strip of land here um, that is on the um, east of the Mediterranean Sea. And what we found was that in the Babylonian era, Babylon, which would have existed around this area, would have done a lot to um, march through Nebuchadnezzar, their king, to begin the captivity of Jerusalem and carry them to Babylon, where they would stay. Well, let me just also let you know that it will be good if you can review, and those of you who are taking notes, you can take the notes, but we can always put it up later. It would be good to review um, Jeremiah chapter 51, Isaiah chapter 45, and then Ezra, the first four chapters of Ezra. Because those Old Testament prophets will have talked a lot about the fact that Judea, Israel, will get into captivity in the Babylon. And one of the things we learned was that they had prophesied then that it would only last for 70 years. So when we get to Daniel chapter 9, we are really at the end of the 70-year period. And we find that Daniel is praying very, very fervently to God to release them from Babylonian captivity as he had promised that would happen at the end of the period of 70 years of captivity. So let's be clear that Daniel understood that he was a captive in Babylon for a period of around 70 years. And so his real mission was to serve God while in captivity. He had no um, foreknowledge, if you will, that he would he would survive this period, but nonetheless, he purpose in his heart to serve God, and that is something all of us could could kind of internalize that even when things are rough, we will purpose in our hearts to serve God. So that is the geography of the region, which we had covered before. We then discussed what we call classical prophecy versus apocalyptic prophecy, but I know you are experts on this thing, you understand it, because basically we say that some of the prophecies that were directly related to very specific circumstances in the Old Testament and were conditional upon what the people did would be classical prophecies, and they were given by some of the prophets like Jonah, and then just last week when we studied 
Nebuchadnezzar and his, um, his going mad for seven years. We learned that for the first year after the prophecy was received, nothing happened to Nebuchadnezzar because he remained faithful to God. So if he had fulfilled that condition and had not become proud and arrogant and given to hubris, he may very well have found himself um, continuing on his glory and his glorious period. That is an important point. That point about choice, which I continue to emphasize, becomes extremely important in today's session because we have to ask ourselves, did Belshazzar have a choice in terms of what eventually happened to his kingdom? And I trust you would have read Daniel chapter 5 before today's session and you would also read Daniel chapter 6 before next week's session. And then we said that there were some prophecies, particularly the prophecies in the later chapters of Daniel and then those of Revelation that are apocalyptic in nature in that they are really um, talking about end time events and that these end time events are not conditional on how people behave or respond, but they simply um, lay out, if you will, the sequence of events that will lead to the end of time and the return of Christ in the heavenly kingdom, right? We also discussed that we are taking an approach, I didn't present all the others because this is a review, we are taking an approach where we said that we are adopting a historicist approach to the book, which kind of says that some of what was um, interpreted or presented in the prophecies happened around the time of the prophet, and it unfolds, if you will, all the way down until Christ comes, all right, on the end of time. So that is the approach we take. We looked at the book of Daniel. We said there was a literary structure that kind of revolved around a fulcrum here in the middle. And we basically suggested that in one instance, we encountered um, God's judgment at the heart of the book, if you will, in these first few chapters, because these two chapters, which we studied last week, which we'll study this week, are really um, demonstrating um, God's judgment and where he executes his judgment. And I'll talk a little bit about that at the end of today's session. But they are also surrounded by the fact that God demonstrates his ability to deliver. And then he gives his ability to show that he has omnipotence and omnipresence. And that he can tell us the end from the beginning. So I, I like this model, if only because it tells us that the book is really being very unequivocal about the fact that God judges. And God executes judgment upon people and upon the world, but that he is a God who is able to deliver when we're in fiery furnaces or in lions, then when people have accused us, when we are thrown by persecution for our faith, God is still able to deliver us. And he delivers us in the context of the fact that he has, he knows the end from the beginning and he has declared a vision of what the world will look like towards the end. What is okay with that? I'll take some questions at the end of this other slide. And then we talked about the fact that we had um, these two approaches to the book, really. Um, and I included a third category to suggest that there are some narrative stories that are really lovely stories you can sit with your kids and go through. And the handwriting on the wall is what we are going through today, which is really a lovely story. Um, and we looked last week at the Mad King. And then next week, we'll study the more very popular story about Daniel and the lion's den. And then as we get to chapter 7, and we saw that in chapter 2, we saw a, a, a sort of outline of world history from an apocalyptic perspective, showing how the world will end and Christ will establish his eternal kingdom, all right? And then when we get to chapters 10 and 12, there is a real pop curry going on inside of there. There are a mixture of, of a real and um, live events versus end time events, all right? Any questions before I move on to the main themes of chapters one, two, and three, and four, which I should have added to the slide, sorry. Any, any, any questions, anybody? You can use the Q&A, um, use the Q&A within the, the Zoom, and you can use the live chat on YouTube, which I haven't seen any. Um, questions coming so far. Okay, so let's keep going. Um, what we discovered about Babylon was that um, certainly what we learned in Babylon in Daniel chapter 1 and 2 was that Babylon has this 
this um, this inclination, this characteristic of their rule, in that Babylon always captures and converts. There's not enough for Babylon to capture, but Babylon must convert. And by the way, Nebuchadnezzar was not the only king of Babylon. As a matter of fact, Nebuchadnezzar had a checkered history after he died in that his son who succeeded him was really not a good king. And then there was a young son who was killed and then his daughter married somebody else and, and there were different leaders along the way until eventually we get ourselves to Belshazzar, right? There was a, a, one of the, 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 the husbands of one of his daughters is a man called Nabonidus. And Nabonidus was actually the king around the time that Belshazzar was king. And I'll talk a little about that in a little bit as we go forward. So, so the kings of Babylon, while the kings changed, they all practiced this principle that became characteristic of Babylonian empires, which was capture and convert. All right? So that we discovered. We then looked at Daniel chapter 2, which gave us a, a real strong outline of world history. It talks about the succession of kingdoms, and so we expected Babylon will come to an end at some point and will be ruled by Medes and Persians. And today, we will actually study this transition that occurs here between Babylon and Media Persia. That is the, the cross of the story, interestingly. And I like to just leave a little bit of trivia as we go along. Um, this chapter has um, about 20 something verses, and just the last two talks about the destruction of Babylon and the media pushers. We just talk about the fact that the king um, had a great feast and he was um, arrogant, etc., which we'll discuss today, right? So we have the Babylonians, the media Persians, Greece, Rome, and then we talk about the fact that where we live today is really with a divided Europe, which is what is our current situation, and that that current situation will eventually be concluded by a great stone that will hit the image at the feet, which is at the time of, of where we are today. Destroy all the kingdoms of the world and his kingdom will last forever. We then looked at the fact that while the image we saw had a succession of the similar materials, gold, silver, brass, iron, iron, and clay, um, Nebuchadnezzar in his arrogance and hubris, and we'll keep repeating that over and over again because that is a characteristic of Nebuchadnezzar that we need to pay attention to. Um, in his, and, and Babylon on a whole. Remember, Babylon has its genesis from the word Babel. The Tower of Babel was being built after the flood um, recorded in Genesis with Noah, where the people said they could build a tower that will reach up to heaven. So Babel was always associated with defiance. And Babylon, in, to a large extent, continued that heritage and that legacy of defiance. And so even though he was shown an image, he himself got this, this vision of an image with the similar metals. When, when Nebuchadnezzar wanted to worship his kingdom and celebrate his kingdom, he built an image of pure gold. And if you have been in this class for the last few weeks, you know that I am not a fan of, of this man-shaped image because the, the um, description we get in Daniel chapter 3 verse 1 speaks more of a geometric image. It simply says 60 cubic high by 6 cubic wide. All right? So we, we kind of assume some sort of rectangular geometric shape as opposed to the shape of a man. But nonetheless, the traditional um, illustrators have always used this and We've gone along with that, if only because it's a good representation of the fact that while one image talked about gold alone, gold followed by silver, sorry, and different metals, Nebuchadnezzar built an image only of gold, which he was trying to suggest that his kingdom would last forever. So he was twisting, he was revising what God said with his own version of the truth. Um, and that we discussed as well, we said it was revisionism, and it represented somebody who is deceiving um, his people by doing his own thing. What we know, however, is that because they use a sexy decimal system of counting, meaning that they counted in units of 60, just as we count seconds, 60 seconds make one minute and 60 minutes make one hour, they use 60 as their counting. For him, then this was a 
a, a, a image that was built according to his numbering system, the numbering system of a man, um, Babylon, if you will, because God's numbering system really surrounds seven, seven days of the week is what God created the world as, etc. Um, but here is Babylon making an image that is 60 cubits high by six cubits wide. And that recurring six is really a reflection of a Babylonian numbering system and a Babylonian time. And that is something that we just take a, a mental note of and we put in the parking lot because we'll have to come back and deal with it. We also are very clear that he seems to have made this image in um, celebration, in admiration, in representation of his god, one of his hidden gods, whose number was also 60. Arun, I think it was. And basically, he is, um, he is attempting to worship the god with the expectation that the god will allow his kingdom to last forever. So what we encounter in here is an example in the Old Testament of, of the uniting of church and state. He brings all his church people together and all his religious leaders together, his sorcerers, etc. And then he gives them the power of the state to say, if you do not bow down, I will throw you in a fiery furnace. But we know that some of the remnant Hebrews who had remained, I use that word deliberately, um, they refused to bow down. And, and they were thrown into the fiery furnace and they were eventually delivered by God, right? So the point to note is that there was an atmosphere of worship and that if they didn't worship, they will find themselves um, experiencing the might of the state. So this is an example, which is something we need to pay attention to, a very, a very small modeling, if you will, of where the church and the state come together to force worship to an image of some larger ancient God, and that if people do not do it, they'd force them to do it, right? And they would threaten them with their very lives and that sort of thing. And that is extremely important. The key message here, even in Papa's slide to represent that, is that God delivers even under these periods of persecution. We talked about the fact that Nebuchadnezzar was a revisionist and he practiced deception by revising the truth. And then last week, we talked about the king's testimony. And we said that Nebuchadnezzar now had a second dream. But this time, this other dream that he got um, is such that he remembers the dream, but he couldn't tell the interpretation. And so he called upon Daniel. Daniel came and interpreted it. And we found that there were at least um, three main parts to this chapter. It was the dream which he got that says, that he saw a tree that was really big and covering the whole earth and providing shelter for animals which represented his kingdom, that a watcher was sent to cut down the tree and um, tie it a band at the bottom and leave it there for about seven years. Seven times was the word that was used, but we know that times means a year by now as good by the student. So it was left for seven years before his kingdom was eventually given back to him, right? So the dream was interpreted. Daniel came and he interpreted the dream. And then after a year where he continued to worship God and thank God for everything, eventually the dream was fulfilled. So that's our review. That's our um, going back in time for a bit. And today we want to move forward. Any questions before we move forward? Anybody? Any questions? Great. Remember, you can use the Q&A in, um, in Zoom, or you can use the chat, or you can use the chat on YouTube as well. So let's go into today's session as we continue to increase our numbers. I see more people are joining, and we're happy to welcome you all today. Let's go to the handwriting of the wall, which is Daniel chapter 5 today. And again, I hope that you have read this chapter, but we'll do a quick summary of what we know as the main events that took place, right? So it reports events that took place, actually the historians bore this out, it took place around 539 BC, when the media Persian army took the city of Babylon. So if Babylon is a huge um, kingdom, then Babylon, the city, was its capital. What does that appreciate that? If you are going to capture Trinidad and Tobago, then you want to capture Port of Spain. Because that's the heart of where everything is happening. And then the, 
natural expectation is that if you kept your polar spin, the rest of the country should be easy enough, right? So in a very similar way, um, Nebuchadnezzar, the media Persians, who were led by a king called Cyrus, and I'll talk about what Cyrus later on, but then is Isaiah chapter 5 to 45, God had prophesied that Cyrus will come and liberate the people. Eh? And then Ezra talks about Cyrus, who will allow the nation of Israel to go back to their lands, etc. So Cyrus is, is um, somebody who was prophesied about and who eventually came. Some of the historians, Maxwell in his book, God Cares One, he actually is, um, had looked at the old writings and stuff, historical writings, not biblical writings, and as able to tie this down to a date, he had October the 12th, 539 BC. And I saw that in some other Wikipedia references and stuff. So clearly there is a, a general acceptance among historians that Babylon was destroyed and captured in 539 BC. So it is around this time, it is this very day, if you will, that Daniel chapter 5 is given an account about, right? So Daniel chapter 5 is about the end of the kingdom of Babylon. Daniel chapter 1 is about the introduction of the kingdom of Babylon. And here we meet King Nebuchadnezzar for the first time. Daniel chapter 5 is about the destruction of the kingdom of Babylon and the introduction of the Medes and the Persians. And here we are introduced to Belshazzar, who is the last king, and Darius the Mede, who is one of the first kings of the Media Persian Empire. So I just wanted to put that context out there so we all understand it, right? Um, so the other thing is to know that although, and some of my slides, they're a little bit busy, but we'll try to go through them in sequence and hopefully it doesn't seem um, as busy and confusing, right? We take our time. So although the media Persian armies were just outside the walls of, ba of ba Babylon, um, Belshazzar the king chose to ignore the danger and he threw a banquet with thousands of his nobles. So it seems as around this period, which I told you um, some have identified to be October 12th, 539 BC, and some, some writings now don't use the word BC, but they use BCE. Um, so BC we know means before Christ. BCE means before the common era, um, which is again just a, another terminology that kind of means the same thing. So it's, it's really used synonymously. And if you see a date that says um, something CE, it means the common era, which is after Christ, um, rather than AD. So, so that's just some confusion that the, the historians brought into our lives, but we, we have a, a key to understand that, right? So the media Persian army will, remember this is not an instant war, an instant battle. So they were taking their time, they were building up their nations, and they were coming close, if you will, to the Babylonian Empire. It seems, and we'll come to that in a little bit, that the, at the time when Belshazzar chose to, to have this big party, there the, the Medes and the Persians were already outside the walls and city of Babylon to come in, but he was not concerned. What would give him such a high degree of confidence? Well, the, the, the structural integrity of Babylon is supreme. Babylon was actually built on the river Euphrates, on the banks of the river Euphrates, and over the river Euphrates. So Babylon is an extremely powerful city. There were multiple walls around the city, very thick walls. Some of them as much as um, maybe, maybe 20 feet or more. They were really, really very thick. Some people said you could actually drive a car on some of those ancient walls, right? They were very wide and big. So there was this view, if you will, that Babylon was impregnable. And in truth and in fact, it was. To the extent that the Babylonians had developed a system of, of sluice gates. And so they had iron gates that they will put down in a river bed that will also protect the sea, protect the city from people who would want to come through the river bed and invade the city because the water from the Euphrates ran through the entire, the entire nation, the entire city of Babylon to the point where once there was water, their livelihood was sustained. You could bring boats up the river. You could open the gates and allow merchandise to come in and go out. You could get water for your meals and pay sustenance, etc. 
So it was really an ingenious city. It was built on top of the river. It was built with, of course, a lot of slave labor. There was a very strong and powerful walls. And then there was a magnificence about the nation. So, so if you were a leader of this, this city, you could be excused, I would think, um, for feeling very, very secure about this place because it was so impregnable that you are, you are lulled into a sense of security to think nothing could happen to you. I've seen some people in Florida build houses that they claim a hurricane crook and they will build them with, with, with structural steel, etc. And I think the last hurricane we saw, some people said they sat out the hurricane in their homes. That's a chance you can take, but the fact is Babylon was in a situation where they were not threatened by hurricanes. They were threatened by more raiding nations around them. And they felt that by building these massive city walls, that they were in a good place where nobody could trouble them. And that is important, right? So they were man-made walls, and he was trusting his man-made walls to protect him. Not his gods, but his walls. All right? As a party developed into a drunken orgy, in that there was a lot of drinking and a lot of wine flowing, Babylonian wine. So, by the way, he had invited thousands of people to this fest. So it wasn't just um, Babylon's um, leaders, but leaders of all the various provinces that they controlled. So here is a good example of, of Babylon um, making the other nations around them drunk with their own wine. And when we get to Revelation, you begin to understand why that is an important, um, an important phrase to understand. But in this, in this party, um, the people from the other nations uh, who are under the influence and control of Babylon are drunk with the wine of Babylon. All right, so I just want you to, to keep that thought very clear in your head. And that when they are doing that, they take the, the, the vessels of the Temple of Jerusalem, which were merely um, ordained, which were really dedicated to the service of the God of heaven, they called now, now this is an interesting little event that is taking place here. Because Nebuchadnezzar had, uh, a, matter fact, a matter of fact, one historian suggests that there was a kind of um, gentleman's agreement in the pagan lands that said, if you invaded my land, do not desecrate my ornaments of worship. Because that was like sacrilege. As a matter of fact, they were, some of them were afraid to do it because they felt if they got the God of some nation they captured, afraid it will come back and haunt them. So there was, a kind of, there was a kind of gentleman's agreement among thieves, if I can call it that, that would say, listen, you could invade me, you could take me, you could destroy me, but we will never destroy or hurt your, your religious instruments. Nebuchadnezzar, um, to his credit, followed this approach. So while Nebuchadnezzar, obviously, as we studied in the past, there were times when Nebuchadnezzar praised the God of heaven for what he had done. What we also know is that Nebuchadnezzar never destroyed the vessels of the Jewish temple, and that he kept them sancti um, sanctified, kept them protected, and there was a kind of sanctity around those vessels that he would not destroy or touch. Now, that was not necessarily by chance. That was God. God knew that he had said that Israel, his people, Judea, would be in Babylonian captivity for a specific period of time, a finite period of time. So that if they were to go back to their nation, then even though the temple was physically destroyed, once they had the vessels, they could restart all their services. So they could have the sacrifices taking place. They could have the, the vessels for showbread and for drinking of the wine for communions and that kind of thing or whatever, but Passover services at the time wasn't communion yet. So they would do all of those things. Um, and, and by preserving them, God was allowing it to happen. Here now you have a situation where the sacred vessels are now being brought into a very pagan type celebration. And we'll talk a little bit about the gods that he was praising. Um, and and he, in doing that, he's basically desecrating the, the vessels dedicated to the God of heaven. Now, I am, I am always careful when I say things like that because 
I don't want you to believe that there's any value in and any spiritual magic in the vessels themselves. The fact is that the Jews would have dedicated these vessels to God and say, Lord, we will use this in your service. And, and that alone, just by dedicating them, that God provided this protection. It wasn't to suggest that they had any magic in them and if you raise them over your head and you spin it around 10 times and all evil will disappear. That was not what we we're saying here. We're simply saying that these were vessels that were used in the worship of the true God. And therefore, God protected his vessels because they become important. The Bible is used in the worship of God. The, the actual paper and stuff may not have any value and the, the computer screen it on and stuff, but the, the fact that it is used in the service of God, God values his word, all right? So while all the, all the um, celebration and drunkenness and, and orgy and stuff is taking place, something happens. They're interrupted by a very supernatural event. And it has to be a supernatural event because nothing else will draw the attention of this group. They are in full um, debauchery. They are in full doing what they want and, and really just living it up. It's as if you are on the streets at the high two, three o'clock on Carnival Tuesday and everything happening and a big screen come up with some message for the country. Nobody taking that on. But if there's a huge, huge supernatural event, all of a sudden the sky get dark, lightning flying left, right, and center, then you will very well find that um, somebody may pay attention to it. So God is using um, this as a way of, of organizing the people and making sure that everything happens. I have a question that has popped up here, and I'll take it in a bit as we go forward, right? Ah, somebody says yes. Yeah, says that 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 um that lime. Well, it's carnival Tuesday or borrow day, but you know this year there is no borrow day except virtually, right? So, so yeah. So so that is interesting. And let me just finish this and let me take the question. And then the other thing was that that very night, Belshazzar and the kingdom pass into the hands of the Medes and the Persians, right? So so this is a sort of summary of what took place. So the question that has popped up on our screen is a question that says, how did the thousands of guests from other nations attend this party if the Medes were outside the gate? So that's a good question. So obviously, Babylon in those days, there is no um, aeroplane and there is no um, fast train to bring people. So when the king organizes a feast like this, it takes a while. To, to make it happen. So he will have, maybe, I don't know, for months before, indicated that he wants to have this big party and this big fete. The people would have been traveling and coming to the city. More than likely, all of them will have had some representative in the city anyway, because if Babylon is the capital of Babylon, if you understand what I mean, one is the city and one is the nation, then for some of the activities that take place and for them to meet with vice regions and for them to deal with governors and stuff, they would have had to come to the city from time to time. So as a matter of fact, there is a there there is very well documented um, um historical writings to suggest by the historians that this was actually the, the Babylonian New Year period. So because it was that period, a lot of people would have been in the city anyway, because the New Year was a period of celebration. Now let me just also let you know, and we will talk about this as we move on, I can talk about this. Belshazzar is what we call a co-regent, in that he is sharing the throne. Now, when we got into the chapter, you remember that when Belshazzar sees the handwriting on the wall, he says, if anybody could interpret this, I will give them clothes of purple and gold, etc., and I will make them a third ruler in the, in the nation of Babylon. He doesn't say a second. He says the third, because the first is Nabonidus, who is his father actually, and then Belshazzar, who is a co-regent with him. And so the only thing he could offer is right after that. So I want us to understand that there's a little bit of interplay taking place here, because when we call Belshazzar the king of Babylon, he is really the king of Babylon's city. But Nabonidus, who is the overall king of Babylon, is the one who is in charge. And Nabonidus doesn't allow 
for his um, his his um, his residence to stay in Babylon, he resides somewhere outside of Babylon in a place called Tima. All right. So so there's an interesting other fact is that's how we have Tobago, Trinidad and Tobago, and and um, Calvin Charles, my good friend, who is as of as of yesterday no longer the chief secretary. But he is in charge of Tobago, and we have our prime minister who has overall responsibility. But when it comes to Tobago, they could claim that they have two leaders, right? In a similar way, in Babylonians' time, there were two leaders. There was the, the Nabonidus, who was the overall king, and he was um, a son-in-law of sorts, if you will, to Nebuchadnezzar. And then you had, and he's the father of Belshazzar. And so he would have said to his son, you run this area here. Yeah. And look after it, and I'll be up the road. So, so I'm saying all that to say that the movement of people was taking place constantly. And then, of course, if it was a new year, you'd have had more people there. And then, on top of that, you'd have a different situation occurring now where um, Nabonidus is attempting to fight Cyrus, the, the Persian king, on another part of Babylon. And he kind of leaves Babylon city to Belshazzar because he has some confidence. That the walls of Babylon is strong enough, are strong enough to protect the city, and he doesn't think there's a big issue there. And that is why when we get to the end of this chapter, we are told that Darius the Mede is given Babylon. He receives Babylon. Because in Judah, in fact, um, Cyrus is also running um, a kind of co-regent approach because it's the Medes and the Persians, they are dual empire, and he allows. While Cyrus is the one who is overall in charge, he, he has designated Darius as his co-regent in the Babylonian area, if you will. All right, so that is, that is kind of what says around that. So that's our answer, not only thousands, but into that place. There are five main, well, four main, five main, four? Oh, I put five. Well, it should be four main sections. That is a mistake on this slide. There are four main sections I want to focus on today. One is a feast and a context in which the feast occurs that I have started to talk about it anyway, but we'll deal a little bit more. The second is the dramatic message and the effect on the people and the remnant prophet. I, the remnant prophet is, of course, Daniel, because he's the last of the prophets of Jerusalem that is remaining and alive around the time that Babylon is going through its, its drama and it's, it's um, heights, but it's demise as well. And, and that is important. And then God's message of examination and destruction, God sends a message to, to, to Belshazzar, and then he sends a message that is, we'll talk about why I call it examination and destruction. And then the, the last one, which is in verses 30 and 31, sorry, I said 20 something. Judgment is executed. Just two, just two verses around the judgment and the destruction of, of the city, all right? So these are the four areas that we want to pick up as we go forward. Any more questions before we go forward? I am kind of excited to go forward because we're going to touch on some real interesting stuff as we go, all right? Were you okay? Let's go. We enter for some excitement, right? So, so let's talk about the feast. So here is, is Belshazzar. He has a huge feast. He has plenty of food. It looks like Christmas before COVID, <laughs> when, when people could have um, had big feasts, no social distance, and everybody liming. They're all drunk with his wine and Babylonian wine. And then, boom, out of the blue, this, this um, hand appears, just a hand. There's no body attached to the hand, not, not, not person, but no physical body attached to it. And they see, if you will, handwriting on the wall. It is dramatic. It is... It's the kind of thing that will really take your breath away. It will stop you from drinking on Borrow Day because you want to know what this means or on Carnival Tuesday, right? This is a big, big event. It is really, really um, supernatural. That's the only way you could stop something like this that is occurring. As a matter of fact, the way Belshazzar speaks when he sees this, it's almost as if he sobers up immediately, right? Um, so, so let's get some facts and some context because this is important. Um, it's 23 years after the death of Nebuchadnezzar, which, we, which historians um, estimated occurred in 562 BC. And Belshazzar is now hosting the feast 
in 539 BC. Am I told you that the historical records suggest that he would have, uh, this night would have occurred on October 12, 539 BC. And I really give credit to the historians for being able to decipher all those um, old artifacts and stuff and be able to look at the historical records of those dates. But that's the date that we have, right? So during the period, Babylon is governed by Nabonidus, who is married to the daughter of Nebuchadnezzar. She is likely the queen that is mentioned in Daniel chapter 5, because obviously the person who comes in as a queen is not Belshazzar's wife. Because he, she kind of talks to him with a kind of um, condense, con, condescension and, and reverence that suggests she's somebody who he holds in high regard. And we believe that that was his mother, right? Um, so she is the daughter of Nebuchadnezzar, so she understands what Nebuchadnezzar went through. And she's married to Nabonidus, who is the real general and who runs things. And he is ruling things, right? Nabonidus appointed Belshazzar as co regent like hopefully you about that already, and he became the governor of Babylonian city. And I use that word governor very loosely because you could say, you could use it interchangeably with king. Because once you were running Babylon, you were like a king. If you go back to Daniel chapter 5 verse 7, this is what I made a reference to to say that in that verse, he says, if you're going to interpret this dream, I'll give you gold and purple, blah, 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 and I, you shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Because he was so troubled that he was willing to give them above everybody else, obviously, except the two kings who were in Babylon at the time. So this is just to understand the context. This is a feast that is taking place when you have two rulers, but by this time, Babylon is in its, in its decay. Babylon is heading towards its end, right? So another busy slide, but let's take it one by one and see if we can gather the main impacts here. Nebuchadnezzar decides to move headquarters from Babylon to Tima, which is an oasis area in Arabia. So he's kind of more an outward man. He wants to be over there, right? He's entrusted the kingship to his son Belshazzar in Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar required even the wealthy. That was the kind of king he was. Unlike Nebuchadnezzar, who was focused on luxury and enjoying the life. Nebuchadnezzar really was a sort of arrogant um, workhorse, if you kind of will, taskmaster. And so he required even the wealthy to work in forced labor, slavery, if you will. The economy became very bad and it became very unpopular. Right? I won't make any references to modern day politicians. Right. Meanwhile, while all of this was happening, Cyrus the Great who was a Persian king, had conquered the Medes. So when he conquered the Medes, they became an alliance, if you will, and Lydia, and he was becoming very powerful. So while Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom is dying and Babylon is dying, the Medes and the Persians, their kingdom is in ascendancy. So one kingdom is in descent, one kingdom is in ascent, right? That is, that is consistent with the image of Daniel chapter 2 that says, after gold shall be silver, right? Nebuchadnezzar is alarmed at the growth of the Persian empower, and he, and he came back to Babylon in 540 after about 10 years, but nobody likes him, right? So he doesn't get a lot of support, he's not popular, so he kind of leaves Babylon in the hands of Belshazzar. Now, it's important to know that what the historians are telling us is that Nabonidus, he met the forces of Cyrus at another place north of Babylon. So there's a lot of fighting going on, if you will. And his own people rebelled against him. By 539, and some argue that this was around the 10th of October, Nabonidus surrenders part of his area without a fight, because the Persians are just too powerful for him. And, and there's a view, if you will, that knowing that, getting a word of that, Belshazzar now believes that he is going to be the one who's going to run all of Babylon. So hence the reason for his big fit. Um, we can argue that a little bit, because when he talks about a third, he still recognizes that Nabonidus is in trouble, is in charge. And then Darius the Mede, has taken some troops south. So they are fighting to the north of Babylon. Cyrus and Nebuchadnezzar, who is outside of Babylon, are fighting. And while they are fighting, 
and it looks as if Cyrus will overcome Nebuchadnezzar, which is a key leader in Babylon. Darius the Mede, who is a core ruler with Cyrus, so we very clear about the relationship between Cyrus and Darius. Cyrus is the head, he's the one who runs the thing, right? But Darius the Mede is his second in command, if you will, because the Medes and the Persians have formed an alliance. So Darius the Mede, he's taken some of the troops and he goes south and they go to surround the city of Babylon. So they're surrounding Babylon and they really don't know yet how they will get inside of Babylon, but they are trying to figure out how to get inside, right? And that is important. One of the ways to get inside is to pass through the riverbed because the river is flowing under the gates into the city. But the fact is that the Babylonians normally close the gates of the riverbed, but this is October. So it is, it is kind of a period where they're kind of moving into more of a winter type period and the river tends to dry up a little bit, right? So as a result, the water levels are not too high. And interestingly, on that very night, the gates to the Babylonian city was open. So here is this crazy man called Belshazzar having a big fit because he believes his city is impenetrable but he leaves the gate open. It's like you in your house with all your alarm and your cameras for your door lock. And the bandit just walk right in. And even though you have alarm and stuff, he don't care because he's inside now and he can take everybody out, right? That was how um, foolish it was for Belshazzar to be having his feast at this time. So that was the background of the feast, right? Belshazzar was an arrogant as his grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar. He felt invincible. And held a great feast while Babylon was besieged by the Persians. So even though the Persians on the outside, and he knows it, he said, well, what whatever, man, let's eat, drink, and be merry. Everything will be all right. So that is interesting. While there is um, signs of destruction, Babylon seems to want to ask everybody, ignore those signs, be drunk with my wine, and enjoy yourselves, because we'll be all right. We have protected ourselves, ourselves, and we don't need to worry about what is happening. He was only trusted in the magnificent walls that Nebuchadnezzar had built and the storehouses of food he had in the capital. He had plenty of food. So he was saying, don't worry. It's like all these people who buy um, toilet paper before COVID. They have toilet paper now for the next two years or so. They don't need to worry, right? So it's an interesting space that he is in at that point in time. He feels very, very confident. Um, so in a demonstration of ultimate arrogance, it is not enough for him to have a fit when all of this is going on. He does something more. The, the king commands that the vessels of Jerusalem be brought to the banquet to serve as drinking cups. Now that really is, is a little bit too far. Not only are you breaching the, um, the gentleman's agreement among heathen nations, but you also define the God of the universe, right? So as if drinking wine from the vessels was not outrageous enough, he also praises their gods while doing so. In the blasphemous use of the temple vessels, they are likely intended to mock the God of Judah and show the superiority of their own gods. And I'll move quickly to the other slide just to deal with that. Because what he does in, in Daniel chapter 5 verse 4, he drinks in the vessels from the um, Jewish worship service. And he praises, look at the gods he prays. The god of gold, silver, bronze, one, two, three, iron, wool, and stone. So a few things here. Actually, two things. One is that there are six gods here. Surprise, surprise. The Babylonian system of numbering is sexy-decimal, and so 60 and subsets of 60 are key for them. So in his view, as he worships his six gods, he's worshiping all the gods of Babylon. Is that okay? So he is having a celebration, even though there are threats all around, and he is praising the gods of, um, of Babylon, 
And then unlike Nebuchadnezzar, who used a fiery furnace to force the people to worship him, he is using wine and strong drink. And as he gets people drunken and stuff, he wants to take all the vessels of other religions and use them in the service of his own religion. I want us to appreciate that, right? So while one uses force, this one uses um, persuasion, he entreats, and he does things that wants us to partake of that. How foolishly they have trusted in their gods. Oh, oh, the other thing I wanted to say about this list is that this list is very similar to the image of Daniel chapter 2. Gold, silver, bronze, iron, stone. You could discount the wood. But interestingly, um, so you begin to appreciate that when God gave an image of gold, silver, iron, and stone, he was basically given the um, Nebuchadnezzar an uh, uh, image that said, this is the entirety of all the kingdoms that will run this world. But when my stone hits and destroys this entire image, God has sent a message that these gods, these, these image gods, these gods of idols, are not a no match for the God of heaven. And that is uh, just another bit of tidbit. You know, along this lesson part, we will pick up little treasures along the way. And, and as we head towards our final destination, this is one you need to pocket and keep nicely. So they trust in their gods that were made of metal, wood, and stone, devoid of the power to save or to act. Were you okay with that? Any questions? As we move in now, we've talked a lot about the feast and the context. I want to go to the second part, which is the dramatic message. It was at this moment when the guests had already gotten drunk reveling in the victory over the God of the Hebrews, some metal, same metals as Daniel chapter 2, when God wrote a message for Belshazzar. So while all of this is taking place, while men lie down, they know if they're up or they're down, they're all drunken, a hand appears out of nowhere and begins to write in the wall, mini, mini, tikel or fasten. Right? So, so that is really... Um, shocking, it, it creates a lot of attention, and people have to figure out what was happening and what is going on here. All right, so I have a question that says, Nabonidus was defeated in the north. How does he not advise Belshazzar to be on guard during this time? So, so it may very well be that um, word had come. As a matter of fact, Maxwell and some of the others um, William Shea and others suggested that Belshazzar had knowledge that Nabonidus was defeated. Eh? But there were two things going for him, and that's why they believed the, the feast was called. Um, one is that he felt impregnable in the city and felt nothing could happen to him, so he was in the safest place. And then there was a bit of selfishness creeping in here and arrogance. If Nabonidus is destroyed, in the, in the battle, because he, he didn't have an idea yet if Nebuchadnezzar himself was destroyed. He felt that he would now become the overall ruler of Babylon. So, so the answer is that it would have very well been that he knew about the defeat of Nebuchadnezzar, which was not too far away. Um, again, historical records seem to suggest it's occurred around October the 10th, and this feast is taking place on October the 12th. So it's just about two days away. Um, so nonetheless, even though he may have heard from some rider or runner what is taking place, he still prefers to enjoy and to take care of himself. It kind of speaks to how sure he felt about the Babylon system being able to protect him and how overconfident he felt about doing things and not being able to um, be overcome. All right? So the, the dramatic message takes place. God uses something dramatic to stop this debauchery that is taking place. The, the people have reached a stage where they are so drunken with the wine of Babylon that God has to do something spectacular to get their attention. And that is something that we just need to keep in mind, right? Um, plenty, plenty of colleagues will tell you that um, sometimes the only thing that will really kind of get their attention is when something spectacular happens, you know, a, a lightning that burned on a tree in front of them or some kind of story. And then things are played a little bit. Um, 
So let's move to the message. So in Daniel chapter 5, verse 5 says, In the same hour, the fingers of a man appeared and wrote opposite the lamp stand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. So it is written on the plaster. So that is, that is by itself miraculous. Because their plaster is hard cement type concrete of that day, right? So it is not, it is not um, expected that any human finger could write on that plaster. So if you had a chisel and a hammer, yes, but not, not by itself. And then once you have a finger writing on, on stone, you immediately begin to have remember stories about a Hebrew God who wrote on two tablets of stone and a monk some years ago. Is that all right? So it begins to create a lot of attention. The, the Bible went on to say that the loins of, of um, Belshazzar got loose and his knees smote together. And everybody has imaginations about what that means. I leave you to figure that out. But some people felt his clothes drop and he, 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 um, he lost control of his bowels and that kind of thing. I don't know. But I mean, I, you, you can figure that out. But that, the fact that they put those descriptions I thought would be extremely significant. It kind of says that this had a debilitating effect upon the king when he saw it, right? So the feast was interrupted by a supernatural, supernatural phenomena. Everybody was scared. So as is normal, if something happens that is supernatural, then you call for supernatural power to help you. So just as happened in the past, he called for the wise men in the kingdom. The wise men came, they looked at the image now. So there's a real progression. Eh? In the first image, in the first dream of Daniel chapter 2, nobody could remember, they came to remember the dream and they couldn't imagine it until Daniel came. In the one in Daniel chapter um, 4, we find where the king remembers, he tells them, but they can't interpret it. Now in Daniel chapter 5, the king doesn't have to tell them, they see it in front of their very eyes. They read it. Um, it's Aramic language. I can tell you that. It's Aramic language. Mini, mini, fecal, person. It's Aramic language. So they know what it says, but it's a riddle. And they cannot understand why it is, insignif why it is significant and what does it mean. So the king says, here we go. I need to incentivize, again, notice Belshazzar's approach. The end of Babylon. Babylon begins as a persecuting power. But by the end, it is no longer stick, but carrot. So he is using um, the, the enticement of reward, if you will, to get devotion and, and homage to him, right? So he's saying, if you can come and be a part of this, then this is what I'm saying. So I'll give you purple clothing, which is royal dignity, a chain of gold, which is authority. And then we return in the kingdom after Nabonidus and myself, right? As in the previous occasion, the wise men could not interpret the message. All right, so I have another question that comes here. What point was Nebuchadnezzar trying to make by drinking, about, drinking out of the vessels, about God or himself? So the question here is, what point was Belshazzar trying to make by drinking out of the vessels? Was it something about God or about himself? I think it's both. So he is, he is we, we had said that before, he is attempting to drink out of the vessels to show that his gods, the god of gold, um, silver, bronze, wood, iron, wood, and stone, um, they are superior to all other gods. So he is basically saying, take the Jewish vessels and bring them here and drink them. And of course, if he is the one who is guarded by all these Babylonian gods, then he is the one who is expected to have a great, uh, a great future and a great um, adorning, if you will, by what is happening, right? So, so that is fundamentally what it is. So, so back to the slide, I want to I establish this point that Babylon is now using enticement and persuasion and promise of reward. Things will be great if you follow them, right? And if you're able to as religious leaders, if he were to do what he wants. So in, in Daniel chapter 3, he's forcing. In Daniel chapter 5, he's enticing. Same tactic, same, different tactic, same result. He wants to unite 
the church with the, with the state and let them do the same things together, right? So he offers these great rewards. Daniel um, is not in the pictures yet because obviously Daniel not in no fet and party. I want you good Christians to remember that. Daniel is not in the fet. Daniel not in the middle of body trying to convert no king. He home. So they, go, they, they went for him. Well, they didn't go for him quickly. The, the queen remembers that there's a remnant prophet. And I want us to always know that while Babylon is going through her drama, God expects his remnant people to remain faithful to him. I can see that over and over again. While Babylon is in her ascendancy and her descendancy and her descent, God expects his remnant people to remain faithful to him. So the, the remnant prophet is remembered by the queen, who is the daughter of Nebuchadnezzar. And she knows that Daniel has done things before. So she says to him in Daniel chapter 5, verse 12, let Daniel be called, and he will give the interpretation, right? And then she says some things about Daniel, which are interesting, and you should go back and read that in the chapter. She says he has his spirit, the Holy Spirit, the spirit of the God of gods. That is what she called it, but I am calling it the Holy Spirit. That's interesting. Here is a heathen lady acknowledging that this man seems to carry the spirit of God. But then I begin to ask myself, how many people can look upon us on our lifestyle and say that we are carrying the Holy Spirit? She didn't even know what the Holy Spirit was. But the way Daniel cared about himself, his life was a testimony of the spirit of the God of God, right? He has superior knowledge and understanding. Remember that, that we should always um, demonstrate that. He's the chief of the wise men, which he got after he interpreted all those dreams from before. And he can interpret dreams all with and explain enigmas. So Daniel had work. Let, let's be clear. In Daniel chapter 8, verse 12, we are told about in the third year of Belshazzar. Daniel seems to have worked under Belshazzar for a while. But after a while, Belshazzar cannot get rid of Daniel. I'm a fact. When, um, when Daniel comes into the, into the banquet hall, I didn't put that, chap, that verse up, but the king is very kind of um, condescending in how he deals with Daniel. He says, aren't you the Hebrew slave that my, fa my father brought here? Um, so that, that's an interesting thing, right? He, kinda, he doesn't think too much of him and he gets him out of the kingdom. So the queen is aware of Daniel, of the influence that Daniel exists in her father. And if anyone could help, Belshazzar, it was Daniel. I want to say that Daniel didn't have to um, advertise how good he was. Daniel and God there and said he was too best to be stressed and too annoyed to be disappointed. He simply lived for God. And when he lived for God, others saw God in him. And when they went through their distress, they turned to him. I think that is, that is a real um, good advice for our modern day Christians in terms of remaining faithful to God. Let's move on quickly. So this is the prophet's message. Now I want us to understand that Daniel rejected the king's reward. The true Christian is not concerned about reward in this life, but in the life to come. But by giving interpretation, God, before giving interpretation, however, Daniel offers a lengthy preamble. He has to give a sermon to this king because it's important to let him know that God has been watching him, examining him, investigating him before God delivers his final judgment upon him. I want to say that again, that Daniel gives Belshazzar a lengthy sermon before he tells him the interpretation, because he wants Nebuchadnezzar to know that God has been examining, not Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar, that God has been examining Belshazzar's life. He has been given an opportunity to come to God, and he's been investigating his life to see if he is up to it. I told you earlier that I believe, I don't think I said, but I want to say it now, that when the Bible um, describes judgment. God is fear. He gives us a chance first before he destroys us. Before God put Adam and Eve out of the garden, he came one afternoon 
and he says, Adam, where are you? And they say, well, we hid from you, and you heard the voice. He say, why are you hiding? He said, because we had sin, all you know is sin. And then they say they made clothes and give them their own clothes. He talked with them. He let them know he had investigated them first. And then he put them out of the garden. That's extremely important. Eh? Um, before he, he destroyed Pharaoh in Egypt, he spent time talking to him through Moses. And then when Pharaoh pursued him, he destroyed him in the, in the Red Sea. So in a similar vein, we're seeing, we are experiencing some examination and evaluation of, of Belshazzar before he does everything, all right? So, um, so he says, this is in verse 22, but you, his son Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, although you knew all about this. Let's talk about that a little bit, right? The king knew about Nebuchadnezzar's experience and how he had repented after humiliation by God. But Belshazzar had chosen not to follow his example. There are two powerful words inside of there. The first is new. God exposed Belshazzar to the knowledge of his treatment with Nebuchadnezzar. And the second is, notwithstanding that knowledge, Belshazzar chose not to follow his example. You know, in, in, this is particularly um, poignant for us today, poignant for us today, and pregnant with meaning because today we're in a situation where we know that if we don't practice social distancing and if we don't stay inside and keep washing our hands, etc., we are likely to catch COVID. Some people are not doing it. And then when they get the disease, they wonder what has happened to them, right? And I'm more on a, another note, some people smoke and they know that it will lead to cancer, but they smoke anyway. They're making choices. So once God would have exposed you to knowledge, then you have a choice. In our spiritual lives, that is also applicable. God exposes us to the Bible. He exposes us to the knowledge of the Bible. And then he expects us to make a choice as to whether to serve him or not. Some of us choose not to serve him, and some say, well, I do still not convinced, and I don't have enough, and that's fine. And God will continue to try to reveal himself. But at some point in time, God will have to bring everything to an end and declare his judgment. I see a question coming. It says, why do you think Belshazzar allowed Daniel to complete the sermon before giving him the red on the wall? I was surprised that he allowed him to. Well, I don't think Belshazzar had a choice. Because Daniel is the only man who knows what's going on. And if Daniel is the only one who knows what's going on and says, before I tell you the, the interpretation, I have to give you a lecture, then you have no choice. Because at that stage, Daniel is the only one who knows what the answer is. He is not in a position to run Daniel because if he gets rid of Daniel, he will not have an interpretation. And two, he's too frightened. He has come to a point where he's so confused that he's grabbing at straws and he wants a solution. He, was, he had humiliated God by, this, by desecrating the sacred vessels. So this, these are the things that Daniel is saying to Nebuchadnezzar. He's saying you knew about your father, your father Nebuchadnezzar. I keep saying Nebuchadnezzar, but it's Belshazzar. He told him that you have desecrated the sacred vessels belonging to God, and God is only concerned because those vessels were appointed to him, and now this man was doing something else. He had praised gods that he couldn't see, hear, or think. So the god of gold, silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone, they couldn't do anything for him now, but he was praising them and thinking that they were the, more, the best thing since sliced bread. And that he knew that his life relied on God, but he hadn't honored him. He knew. So Daniel was saying to him, you know that you depend on God. Just because Nebuchadnezzar had Two opportunities. This time I really mean Nebuchadnezzar. After the fiery furnace and after the seven years of madness, Nebuchadnezzar proclaimed to all and sundry that the God of heaven is the God of all, and that is the God we should pay attention to. So clearly, um, Belshazzar had a proper understanding, but chose to ignore all that and follow his own um, his own way of, of salvation that he chose, right? Does not. So I wanted to say to you that the message 
is a message of examination and destruction. I am using that word examination deliberately. God examines before he destroys. God asks, you know, what is happening? What is going wrong here before he destroys? And I want us to appreciate that this is occurring here, right? So this is the inscription. It says, mini, mini, tikel, ufasen, right? So this is what was written. As I told you already, it is Aramic. It means numbered, numbered, weighed, and divided. Let me just say something here. Um, and some, some have argued that the, the tense used in this, in this Aramic writing is included in fact past tense. In other words, it could also be translated to say number, number, weight, and divide, right? But that is not what God is saying to, to Belshazzar. He said, I have already numbered you. I have already weighed you. And I am going to divide you, right? I've decided to divide you. You will be divided. So, so this is a, a message of, of um, the end of God's work. God has already examined um, Belshazzar. And in numbering just simply means he's checked on him. Whenever the nations wanted to see how many people they have, they will do a, a census or a population census. That was happening around the time of Jesus and stuff when Mary and Joseph and stuff were running to become part of the census with Herod and stuff. So, so by saying numbered, he understood immediately as a king that God had checked up on him. Wearing simply means that God examined what he's worth. Not that I've checked up on you. What are you worth? How do you measure? Now, the way you must be measured against something else. What is the standard? If you go to the grocery and they tell you this weight 12 pounds, well, they, in the old days, they actually have pound weights. Um, but it was a true balance scale and not these electronic and fancy things now. And they would use different weights until they got the balance, right? And either add more fruit or add more weights until it all balanced. So it was being weighed against a standard. So God had weighed Belshazzar against a standard and then concluded that he was not worth it. He was not somebody he could, he could really preserve and he would therefore divide his kingdom and, and, and throw it off, right? So the, the, the message was written in Aramic, but it was not easily understood and not interpreted. It was not easy, right? So here is Daniel now. So Daniel comes and he says, Many, which means numbered, God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. God has checked how long this kingdom will last and you are about to come to an end. Tikel means you have been weighed in the balances and found wanted. You fasten, which is sometimes translated in some Bible translation as Perez, which also means Persians. It really is an a idiomatic word, if you will. And it means that your kingdom has been divided and given to the Persians, the Medes and the Persians. So this, this message was really, a, this is at the end of all Nebuchadnezzar's drunkenry and wine and, and, and fretting. So there's no coming back here. God has done all he could do. He numbered him, he checked him, saying, now nah, you're worth it. And so that is what has happened to Belshazzar. I see a question. So somebody is saying here, I can't recall you mentioning the king getting a diary, which I think is significant because it's an embarrassing moment for the king. So I, I did mention that in, um, in Daniel, um, in early chapters, they talk about the fact that his loins was loose and his, his legs, um, his knees smooth together, and that we have interpreted that to mean that he experienced bowel movement. Um, so, to, so that is kind of what we interpreted that. I didn't, um, I didn't specify it was diarrhea, but we could certainly infer reasonably that that is what it was. And indeed, it was an embarrassing moment. So again, the fact that he was embarrassed and afraid kind of ties into the whole, um, somebody asked how, why he allowed Daniel to have this preamble. I think he was so embarrassed and so afraid at the same time that he was in no mood to exercise any great authority to say I don't want to destroy anybody and that kind of thing. The other question says, does, does Perez mean the same as Ufasin? And I'm saying that, yes, some biblical translations seem to, um, seem to use those words 
interchangeably. Um, you fasten is really the plural of the Arabic word Perez, which means divided into more than one. Right? So in, in other words, the, that's why I say it's an idiomatic expression. When we do idioms in, in languages, we kind of say the way the word is structured, it means more than what it means literally. So as an idiomatic expression, you fasten really means your kingdom is divided, but divided um, to the means and the Persians. The Persians shall have your kingdom. That is effectively what it means. Okay, any other questions before I move on? We, we're making good progress. I think we should be finishing just a bit. Um, the other thing to note here is that Daniel didn't suffer. You know, when we were last week discussing Daniel's response to Nebuchadnezzar, we said that Daniel was kind of careful of he told Nebuchadnezzar that he would go mad and he would be out for seven years because Daniel still was trying to save Nebuchadnezzar because Nebuchadnezzar clearly had some uh, good points and he was trying to show him how he can continue on and be a great king, right? Um, in this case, however, in the case of Belshazzar, Daniel is not so inclined. He is not making any effort to try to pour water in his mouth, so to speak. Babylon is at the end of the road. He tells the king what has happened. The king has not changed his attitude and his sentence will be fulfilled that very night. Now notice, what does Belshazzar do? Belshazzar takes the same clothes he promised and he gives it to, um, he gives it to Daniel just as he had promised. In other words, here is a man who just told you that your kingdom would be divided and you would be destroyed. But he proceeds to give him all his wealth. What is the value of wealth and clothing and gold if you're going to be destroyed in the next few hours? But again, that seems to be lost upon Belshazzar and he's simply doing what he thinks is right. So another question has come in. Let me just take it quickly. So is it that God will only exercise judgment after warnings? What about those who have never heard or will hear the gospel? That's a good question. So there are some interesting um, passages in Romans, for instance, that talks about, and even when we look at the book of Acts, where people were worshiping the unknown God, we, we believe that God is always trying to reach people. And he reaches people either through nature, where he can, just through the awe of humanity, or sometimes, as has the case in, even in a lesson like this, where God speaks us through his explicit word through the Bible. So God is reaching us through many different things. And he really is going to judge us according to what we know. Um, not what we're supposed to, but what we know and what we've been exposed to. So in this case with Belshazzar, He's saying that you had the benefit of the experience of Nebuchadnezzar and he didn't do anything about it. And that is what we are concerned about. The point I want to make here is that irrespective of how God speaks to us, is that we have choices to make. And the question is, are we going to follow God or follow our own inclinations? And that is the bigger question. All right, let's keep going. So... We have, let me just say that we have had, so far we up the message and we up the dramatic event, but now the rubber meets the road, right? We get into the end. That very night, the king of the Chaldeans was slain. That's what verse 30 to 31 says. And Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. Mafagi King James Version says, Darius the Mede took the kingdom. So some have translated that passage to say, took over. In other words, Darius, as we said before, would have been a co-regent with Cyrus. And therefore, he would have had, um, he would have had to deal with that Babylonian issue afterwards. Somebody is asking a question that says, I think as Belshazzar made a promise, he honored his word concerning the reward. Fair enough. So she's saying that given the fact that Belshazzar continued to give Daniel the, the gold and the, the fine clothes and stuff. But know that Daniel told him before, I don't really want your stuff. I don't want your reward. I will just give you an answer. But I, I, I get a sense, if you will, and that's just my own supposition. Right? There is no basis for it. I get a sense that, that Belshazzar is so 
secure in his view that Babylon cannot be um, infiltrated by anybody, that he ignores all of that. He says, yes, you, you interpret this, hold that, but we good, because we know what we've done. If he was really concerned, I think he less concerned about reward and go and try to fortify a city and maybe find out that the gates below the river were still open. And any reason, another question says here, any reason why judgment was executed so swiftly? So that's a good question. Is it swiftly? God had been trying over and over again with Babylon. God had been really trying to get them to the point where they would um, come to what he wanted. He tried so much time with Nebuchadnezzar. I suspect he tried with Belshazzar, but Belshazzar was hard in his heart and what he wanted. So I think really um, this message that many, many Thikel and Farsin came at the end of the kingdom. So really the, the judgment being executed, it came just before the end of the period. I think what God is doing here is simply letting um, Babylon know why they are being destroyed at this point in time. I think Babylon already knew that they were on a trajectory for destruction. And they were on a trajectory that will allow them to get to the point where their kingdom will be overcome. So it, it may not be as swift as we think. It's swift in the sense of relative to when they got the message. But by the time they got the message, remember the, the whole message is in past tense. You have been numbered, you have been weighed, you have been found wanting, and your kingdom is divided. This is end time this is this is this is it you know god is simply um and maybe that message was more so for the jewish people who are wrong to know that god will really complete all that he said he will right okay let's keep going um the the, the other point i want to make is that while the people in babylon were enjoying the peace the persians were taking a canal to divert the river you create these which was upstream and then in doing that, they crossed the walls by using the riverbed and easily entered the city, which was left unguarded because of the peace, which is really a reflection of the um, arrogance by the king at the time, right? Um, the city was captured in some hours and Belshazzar was killed. Um, Cyrus then continued to chase after Nebuchadnezzar and Darius the Mede stayed on as the governor or the king of Babylon, right? So he became the one who ran things. The story of Belshazzar teaches us to make the most of opportunities that God mercifully, mercifully gives us to accept his salvation. That is what the story is about. The, the, the preamble that Daniel gave to Belshazzar is something we should study over and over again. Because God is saying how much he tries, how much I try to save you, and you will not allow me to save you. Um, some concluding thoughts I want to leave with you around Daniel chapter 5. The cause of the king's downfall was that Belshazzar had not honored God, a lesson that Nebuchadnezzar had learned, and that when Daniel spoke to him in Daniel chapter 5 verse 23, Daniel talked about our God, the God of heaven as a God of creation. He's talking to Babylon. And he's reminding him that there is a God of creation. Look at what chapter, verse 23 says. He says, But as lifted up thyself, meaning you, Belshazzar, that is the context, have lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven, and they have brought the vessels of his house before thee, that is the sacred vessels, and thou and thy lords, thy wives and thy concubines, have drunk wine in them. So they have, drinking, they have drunk Babylonian wine, in God's vessels, and thou hast praised the gods of silver, God of silver and gold, of brass, iron, and wood and stone, which see not, nor hear not, nor know, and the God in whose hand thy breath is. This is the God who made it. That's what he basically saying. The God of creation, and in whose are all thy ways, thou hast not glorified. So Daniel has given an interesting message here, and I. That's why I said these are some concluding thoughts, as we've been doing throughout all these us, to suggest to us that Daniel is contrasting a God of creation with a God of the created stuff. And we need to remember that our God is a God of creation and not of created wood and metal and idols. 
He's a God who deserves our worship and he's a jealous God, right? The other thing I want you to remember, and that's why I asked you to go back and do some reading for me in Jeremiah and Isaiah, because this becomes important when we get to Revelation, is that Jeremiah had some prophecies around Babylon. He says in Jeremiah chapter 50, verse 9, Behold, I am stirring up and bringing against Babylon a company of great nations from the north country, and they shall fight against her. If you know all of this, Jeremiah was way before even Daniel. He would have been a contemporary around Daniel, but he was an old man at the time. So, so there were already prophecies from Judea, which would have filtered up to the king, that God had predicted the destruction of Babylon. So that's why I kind of like to say it wasn't sudden or swift. It was simply doing what God had promised to do. In Jeremiah 51 to 36, he says, I will dry up her sea and make her fountain dry. Isn't that prophetic? That is classical prophecy at its best because that's exactly what happened. The Persians diverted the river of Euphrates and then walked in the sea, in the water bed, the river bed, to get into Babylon, right? And then she says, he says, she, Babylon, will never be inhabited again. Well, that's, there's a long historical record to suggest that the Medes and the Persians, when they came in, they established their, their center of gravity for their Persian kingdom away from Babylon. You recall that in the book of Esther, we are told about the, um, the king being in a place called Sushan. And, and later on in Daniel chapter 8, we encounter him on the plains of Sushan, etc. So that the, the Persians would have established alternative places. And even um, Alexander the Great, when he passed through, he too tried for one time to restore Babylon. And then by the time he died, his generals went separate ways. And this prophecy was fulfilled. The point I want to make to you is that when the prophecy tells, told us that Babylon would be destroyed, Babylon was destroyed. God's word is true. God's word is sure. All right? The, the other points I want to make with you very quickly is that um, three, three key points. When, when in Daniel 5.11, the queen referred to him as the spirit of God, she was certainly recognizing the Holy Spirit would have empowered the life of Daniel. As Seventh-day Adventists, we believe in the Trinity, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, as most Christians. And we believe that the functional role of the Holy Spirit is to work within our hearts, activate our consciences, speak to our intellect, and move us to the point where we make decisions and choices, which we have to make, but he tries to persuade us to serve God, right? The other thing is that we must try to learn from our past experience. There's an interesting quote, by the author Ellen White, who said, we have nothing to fear for the future, except that we shall forget the way the Lord has led us. We have heard that so many times before. And his teachings of our past history. We are now a strong people, if we'll put our trust in the Lord, for we are handling the mighty truths of God's word. We have, not, we have everything to be thankful for. So the first point I wanted to make was that the Holy Spirit was present even in Old Testament times and worked through Daniel to create truths. The second point I wanted to learn is that um, we need to learn from our past experience of others. And then the third point is that God's sovereignty is paramount and God's sovereignty is important. One of the big things God had against Belshazzar was that Belshazzar denied the sovereignty of God and the fact that he was in charge. That is throughout this whole um, chapter, we've seen God's sovereignty being established, right? And then my, my penultimate slide, I want to really make a pitch for you for Belshazzar had a choice and he experienced the consequences of his choice. That must be a reminder to all of us. He was weighed against the standard, he was found wanting, and therefore he was destroyed. There seems to be two stages of biblical judgment an evaluation examination phase, and an ex executive phase, right? I say the executive. Belshazzar was first weighed and from one thing he was examined. And then before he was, that was before, he was destroyed and executed. So that's important. And then my concluding slide. Babylon evokes Babel. 
its ancient its ancient predecessor, as we saw in Genesis chapter eleven. Both are icons of human hubris, meaning human pride. Both attempted to blur the line between heaven and earth. And in both stories, a confusion of language signaled the end of their projects. When he saw the writing on the wall, he wasn't sure what, to, what, to the, what it meant and how to interpret it. But the demise of the Babylonian Empire is not the end of the spirit of Babylon. So we've spent a lot of time in these first few chapters talking about the fact that there, is a, there are characteristics of Babylon, capture and convert, seem to want to worship the gods of gold, um, silver, bronze, iron, wood, stone, seem to want to have their own numbering system and their own form of worship, seem to want to carry worship through force and through violence, as well as through enticement and love of reward. And we say that that spirit of Babylon still exists, and that Babylonian ideology, ideol, ideology sorry, reappears in Daniel chapter 11, and then in full force in the book of Revelation. When Revelation talks about Babylon, she's not talking about a literal Babylon, but we're talking about a figurative Babylon, which is what we've studied. Belshazzar's desecration of the temple vessels was just a shadow of spiritual Babylon's assault on true worship and God's heavenly sanctuary. But like its historical counterparts, the end time Babylon will eventually be obliterated by God's eternal kingdom. So there's just a, these last two bullets are really just a taste of what we will study very carefully and deliberately when we get to Revelation. But I thought it's about time we start to introduce these things into our consciousness. That's my last slide. 